This is a worldwide movement to protect our children. Thank you for being here. Today, there's only one thing I absolutely want to accomplish in a clear and public expression. We are working to make a substantive change to a policy in the church, which is how we interview children. Uh, today, we take children behind closed doors all alone, the child and the bishop or other leaders in the church, and ask them questions that frequently are very explicit uh, sexually. We're working to bring a halt to that. Now, I had the reason that the march was done is that I've been working at this for two years and no change, not even a whisper of a change, has uh, been made over those two years until four days before the march. So it was really to, um, to bring it to a fore in a way that I'd not been able to do it before. If the LDS church has evidence of a crime, someone needs to pick up the phone and call the police and make sure that anyone who, could, who committed a crime against a child is reported to the police so this never happens again. <laughs> We need to think LDS church needs to be proactive. They need to be pro victim. They need to protect every child that walks into any activity sponsored by the Mormon faith. Because we need to remember the sexual abuse of a child behind a closed door is never the child's fault. And I speak to every victim of child sexual abuse, many of whom are in this crowd right now. And I tell you from the bottom of my heart, as I tell myself every single day, it was not your fault. We believe you. We support you. We stand beside you. And we will fight with you. Would you like to share your name and what brings you out here today? Sure. My name is Kristen Polson, and I come out here because I support this movement and I have my own personal story <laughs> to share with it. Sorry. I was raped when I was in college by a former MTC teacher and a return missionary. And I went to my bishop to ask for help because I didn't know what to do. And I was, I think I was only about 20 years old at the time. And he treated it as if I was unclean and needed to be shamed. He said that I was allowed to talk in church, to take the sacrament, to pray, to do anything that had me speak up or anything. And I was to read the miracle of forgiveness and repent for my sins, even though I felt after thinking about it, I felt as if I was probably a victim. And that was the first point that it started to really hit to me that something about this wasn't right. And that leaders are supposed to protect victims of rape and yeah, I don't identify myself as a victim anymore. I want people to feel comfortable coming forward with their story and knowing that there's help and there's there are other people like them and these things have happened to so many people and they shouldn't. They really just shouldn't. It's one one person to have this happen to is too many. And that's why I'm here. The first time I raised this issue was two years ago, a little over two years ago. I met with my bishop and my stake president about several concerns I had. This one was definitely one that I discussed and was concerned about. So the first time I talked with the bishop 
and the state president was together over two years ago. Now since then, <clears throat> I have reached out to them many, many times. I've written, I've put down my concerns in writing and sent that to both my bishop and my state president. The final meeting with those two local leaders, the bishop and the state president, was the end of January and it really was kind of the end of that path, almost a two year long journey to try to um, bring the issue uh, to somebody's attention and actually affect change, if not in the church, at least in my ward and stake. So the last time was, was the end of January when I brought it to them and they made it very clear that no changes were to be made and that I was not to continue talking about this matter. I reached out to, I have a friend that is 70 and I gave him a call and he was nice enough to return that call and we talked about it. <clears throat> he didn't think, to, didn't think there was any problem whatsoever with our, um, what we're doing today. I also reached out to public affairs, brought the issue up to them. Of course, they don't have any real authority, but I thought it might raise the issue to some level that wh where somebody could make some decisions. And I also wrote a letter to the apostles and I have not heard anything uh, about that. Now, now there, with regards to writing a letter to anybody above your state president, in the handbook, it does state something about the, uh, the channels. It states that we should not write letters to the general authorities, and if we do, those letters will simply be written, sent back to our state president for him to address. So it's kind of a circular uh, pattern a circular uh, mode of raising issues that you're supposed to bring it to your bishop and the state president and if you bring it to anybody else's attention they're just going to refer it back to your state president. But I pursued them all. It takes a long time when you're psychologically sexually abused to realize what happened to you. Uh, my story is not one of those stories that um, I was not molested in a bishop's office. I was not sexually abused. But um, my spirit was brutalized. And I was told that, I, I was fed false doctrine that I could only be forgiven of this sin once. And that if I ever sinned, again, that there would be no forgiveness for me. And I became terrified to live. I became terrified of myself. I became terrified of making any personal decisions. And my life at that point came to be just doing what I had to do and saying what I had to say and trying to think what I had to think so that I could be in the grace of God again. And it took me years and having three children before I realized what had happened to me. And it was being a mother and having my children that I started to realize the true nature of God as I looked at those sweet little ones and I thought I would never, ever do to them what was done to me. My name is Mark Malin. <clears throat> I'm a board-certified clinical sexologist and author of scientific research on the history of sexual attitudes in Mormon culture. Some of you know my work. My doctorate is in sexual science. One of my specialties is researching and treating psychosexual shame. My wife, Colette is a psychotherapist and a certified sex therapist. I'm here today to speak as a scientist. I'm interested in the scientific data that many of you have provided in the form of personal subjective accounts of your experiences in LDS priesthood interviews. These are your stories. 
of your church experience. These are your testimonies. So what does this data tell us as scientists? In general, it's telling us that there are two major types of sexual abuse that were a result of priesthood interviews, one-on-one -on -one with children behind closed doors. The first type is hands-on physical sexual abuse. I call this type overt sexual abuse. The second type is psychological psychological sexual abuse, and I call this type of sexual abuse covert sexual abuse. The physical sexual abuse in your stories come from leaders with untreated pedophilia. Some priesthood leaders clearly are pedophiles. There's ample evidence. Some have been prosecuted. The majority are not pedophiles. However, the problem is that these pedophiles are wolves in sheep's clothing. They appear on the outside to be harmless and trustworthy. They're only discovered after harm has been done and their victims gain enough courage to, to report them to the authorities. Can a pedophile victimize a child if they're not alone with them? Would ending one-on-one -on -one interviews behind closed doors significantly protect our children? The answer is obvious. Today, by marching, we are asking this to stop. I was raised in the church and, and uh, I don't know what my experiences as far as uh, how it relates to the this uh, march and this um, what's the word this this cause is um, I guess like it, to be honest like I'm I'm gay and um, it that has its own struggles um, but it, it kind of relates back to this where it's like you're kind of just shamed into um, just de endless depression, I guess, and and I, the one-on-one -on -one questions from people who aren't uh, qualified to ask these kind of psychiatrist-type questions uh, can be really harmful if you're if you don't fit the Mormon cookie-cutter mold. Um, I. I don't think my experiences are quite as severe as others uh, with kind of the, the severity of the questions that I was asked. Um, they, I think there was still enough though to just cause some depression and, and suicidal thoughts and have a big impact on me negatively. And it's it shouldn't be that way and, and um, something needs to change so others don't have to go through what I had went through or what others went through who, who had it worse than I did. Now, let's look at the second type of sexual abuse you reported in your testimonial stories, the psychological sexual abuse, your data. These are far more, there are far, far more examples of this type in the data. It's a very serious problem. It stems from well-meaning advice and counsel from untrained leaders that is unintentionally shaming. In the very worst cases, though, the shaming is intentional. Terrifying children about their sexual feelings causes them to disassociate or hate themselves this is a formula for disaster. Elizabeth Smart, who was kidnapped right here in Salt Lake City, raped and held captive for nearly a year, spoke at John Hopkins University. Elizabeth explained that during a morality object lesson, 
Premarital sex was compared to being like a chewed up piece of gum. I'll never forget how I felt lying there on the ground, she said. How could anyone ever love or care for me after this? I thought, oh my gosh, I'm that chewed piece of gum. Nobody rechews a piece of gum. You throw it away. And that's how easy it is to feel like you no longer have any worth. Why would it even be worth screaming out? Why would it make a difference if you were rescued? Your life still has no value. No value. Psychosexual abuse is covert and often unintentional. This makes it very, very pernicious. Psychosexual abuse is like a house infected with termites that eat away at its integrity unnoticed until one day the walls just completely collapse. Nobody on the outside notices until the damage is done. Yes, what I have seen is it's more, uh, is kept more secretive. Uh, the PR, because of the public relations, uh, I believe the church doesn't want this to be broadcast. I know they do a lot of um, gag orders on people. They have a lot of lawsuits that do go on that people are not aware of, that there are children out there and up to adults that are being abused, and then they don't let it be known. So it's very rare when something is made public with the abuse that goes on. So that's what I believe is they don't want it to be broadcast. They don't want a bad name, quote unquote, for the church. But what I believe is that makes things worse. Because one thing I do respect the Catholic Church for is that they came out and did acknowledge what has, was happening to these boys and they took care of it. And I think what happens in the LDS Church, they want it to be kept more secretive for the PR and also for the money, the lawsuits that could come about because of it. And I am an, an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I believe in the doctrine. I know the principles, ordinances, everything are true and correct. I just do not agree with how things are handled sometimes, and especially with abuse and children being kept, this, this being kept hidden, hidden, kept hidden. How do I say that anyway? It's being kept hidden. It's like a secretive, um, society in a way, and I don't like that. I don't like the idea that they hide it. It seems like this march is in response to the fact that they are hiding it. What is it that we all hope to accomplish while being at this march? Well, I'm hoping that we bring awareness to not only um, bishops or leaders, ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical leaders, but also mostly parents. There are a lot of parents in the church that just trust that everything's going to be okay if they are alone with a leader or in a building, even a church building, alone. I used to, I used to teach aerobics to a group of women, and they would come in and just let their children wander in the hallways. And there was a janitor there. One of the one of the perpetrators in my abuse was a janitor, and they just trust that because they're in a church building or with a church leader, that everything's going to be okay. And it's not always that way. Sure, there are good leaders. There are good people. Good-hearted leaders. I've seen them, I know them. There are also those others that I, have ex that I have experienced as a child growing up that they were perpetrators, pedophiles, and they used their position to cover that up. My colleagues in ministry are absolutely stunned when I describe this practice to them. I am not exaggerating when I say that this would result in the discipline and defrocking of ministers in all Christian denominations of which I am aware. And I don't say this to shame the Mormon church, though they should be ashamed. <laughs> I say this to educate and to plead for reform. This practice, which was described in the church's official statement in response to our permission as an important part of ministering to a congregation, is nothing of the sort. Loving, trustworthy relationships between bishops and ward members is an important part of ministering to a congregation. 
coming alongside them in sickness, in loneliness, grief, death, and even sin. Yes, that's an important part of ministering to a congregation, but a standing mandatory inquisition complete with a standardized checklist to test loyalty and purity is not an important part of ministering to anyone. There were a lot of parts of the LDS church that were exploited that made me vulnerable uh, to my perpetrator. The, the shaming, the self-loathing, the, the church never takes responsibility for anything and shoves it all on the members. You know, I'm not praying hard enough. I'm not, I don't understand. I'm not humility enough. I'm not, I need to repent more. I need to do my home teaching more. It, it seems like they always shift responsibility to the members, which is victim blaming, classic victim blaming. So they, they groom us to be victims. I'd love to see the church actually take responsibility. Dear Apostles, I support you 100% in making a change to completely protect our children from one-on-one -on -one interviews, the bad things about that, and then actually asking sexually explicit questions. So Dear Apostles, if you make that change, I support you 100%. There's 56,000 people I know that will support you 100%. Actually, the entire church will accept this 100% percent. You're not going to have people questioning your authority. Actually, you're losing authority right now. You're losing um, respect right now among people that recognize this is a, a horrendous practice. We're the only church in America, that the only one that does this. Uh, you will receive great respect and great support from members of the church. Not only that, you are going to look wonderful to the world that already knows what we're doing behind closed doors with our children. You are going to look like heroes that you stood up to protect our children. So there, there, there is only good things that can come out of uh, making, mandating these changes. Not mandating, there's only bad things that will continue to come out of it. There are many resources we are not tapping into. Our children and teens deserve a spiritual home where they are not shamed for healthy sexual feelings thoughts, and actions. They deserve to go through these years of sexual development without guilt based on misinformation and the cynifizing, yes, I like to make up words, the cynifizing of normative behavior. Our children and teens deserve a spiritual home where gospel principles and trauma-informed mental health standards are not in conflict with one another. Our children and teens deserve a spiritual home where leaders and the organization as a whole walks the walk, not just talks the talk. If our young are expected to follow principles such as choosing the right and repenting for wrongdoing, that they can see clear examples of that coming from above. Our victims and survivors need and deserve an apology partnered with adequate restitution attempts. And Elder Oaks, if you're in the business of ministry, please know if you don't already, that apologies are necessary and healing. was born in the church, raised in the church. Um, my husband and I married in the temple. It's been almost nine years. And uh, just recently, over the last couple years, we did a lot of soul searching on if we were you know, really happy in the church or not. Um, and we eventually decided that it wasn't really for us but we have so many people that we love, our family members, our friends, that are still in the church. And Sam Young's cause has been important to us because of those other people that are still in the, in the church that we love. Um, I would hate for anything terrible to happen to 
my nieces or my nephews because they've been put in a position that isn't safe for them. Um, so I'm just really thankful to Sam Young for speaking up and and bringing to light these issues and giving us a way to be able to uh, make our voices heard too. Thank you. We are not going to stop hammering and hammering and hammering until the danger to our children is crushed. So, my dear friends, who have been dealt such indignity, indignity, and years of crippling shame, we apologize <laughs> to you, not just with empty words, we apologize and give you voice with our deeds of monumental marching action. May we go forth in love and protect our children. I don't know how in touch the leaders of it, how in touch the apostles are with what's happening on the ground level. I've heard many people tell me they're isolated from, uh, by many layers of what's happening. I don't know if that's the case or not, but frankly, I'm assuming it is. Because if they knew the horrendous things that are happening in bishops' offices, I can't imagine anybody that is close to God that is concerned about following the teachings of Jesus Christ, of protecting children, listening to how Jesus Christ talked about children. He, I don't know if there's a stronger threat that Jesus Christ made to any other thing happening than what the threat he made to those that would harm children. He said, anyone who offends one of these little ones, it would be better than a millstone be hung around their necks and they be thrown into the sea. Now that's a pretty serious threat to be making. Yet here is what we're doing to our children. Are we responsible for that? Uh, are we the ones that are gonna have the millstone thrown around and put around our neck? I think if the apostles were to sit down with me and sit down with the thousands, the 3,000 people who wrote this, who were harmed in their childhood, I think they would be on our, um, be on our side, beyond the side, beyond the side of Jesus Christ. Uh, so they could very well be isolated. That's really the only explanation I can come up with why they are not making these changes immediately. My name's Ashley Warnock, and I came to this march because. My cousin sent me a link to it on Facebook and I read and I watched the interview with Sam Young and it was the first time I realized that as a young girl in a bishop's interview, I had been asked if I touch myself. I did not even know what masturbation was. And as an adult, looking back on that experience, I think that was a horrible position to put a young girl in. And I think it's a horrible practice to teach young children, that good children, go in a closed room with an adult male and talk about sex. I think it causes a normalization of that behavior which puts them at risk in that moment and also makes them more likely to, to be comfortable going in any room with an, alone with a man and talking about sex. And I think it really needs to stop. So this is one message I'd like everybody to hear. The apostles, if you're listening to me, uh, all members, bishops, state presidents, this movement, this movement is not going to stop until the policy is abolished.